big smoky sky howdy and welcome from the blazing inferno of western montana to another episode of world bigfoot radio once again i have rich sewell back with me and we're going to talk about a bunch of things here you guys should really have fun with this uh episode because we got a, a number of things we're going to touch on here and once again he was kind enough to supply us with plenty of visual images and so without further ado, let me once again welcome back uh, Rich Soul to the show. Hi, Rich. Glad to have you back, buddy. Duke, good times. Thanks for having me. Always welcome here. So uh, first thing we wanted to talk about a little bit was, uh, you know, in as much as you go around and you research these tree structures all over the country, that isn't all you do. You go on some of these expeditions and have been close to Bigfoot a number of times and have seen them. So I was wondering if you wanted to share some of your uh, more interesting experiences along those lines with the listeners. Yeah, yeah. I've had, uh, you know, over the years, I've had quite a few experiences where I've gotten very close to them. They've gotten very close to me. Um, and it's, you know, uh, I, I can talk about some recent stuff, and then if you want me to go into other uh, stories, I can uh, go over the red squatching stuff if you want me to talk a little bit about that just a couple weeks ago um, and then I've got yeah, some other you can bring us, definitely bring us up to date on what happened out there with the red squatching uh, expedition I'm sure people would be really interested in hearing about that and then you know feel free to like wander back into the depths of time and perhaps even other continents uh, onto another subject that we already just said we were going to discuss and we'll just keep you guys in suspense until then uh, so go ahead yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the this just a couple weeks ago we had uh, a red squatching expedition. We had a lot of activity there, and one of the things that I, you know, we talked about just a little bit ago, and we'll get into that more, is when we're out in the bush, especially a lot of the researchers I've been with in the Midwest area, but it really it's it's anywhere that Bigfoot is at, is the phenomenon of eye glow, and uh, we'll get into a little bit more about that, but. That's something that I uh, lean very heavily on when, I, out, when I'm out in the dark there, uh, and I've had them get very close to me. And so uh, we had some really good examples of that just a couple weeks ago. Um, we had them peeking around trees. It was kind of bizarre because uh, we had a bad storm here. We had really bad weather, and there was a lot of storm damage uh, in Lincoln where I live, but up in Macy, which is a couple hours away from here, just the tail end of that storm was kind of whipping around. So it made a really kind of horror movie-like uh, experience for us that night. We did a, a night op and we did an overnight. Uh, we camped out there uh, up in the up in the bush where that where we found a lot of structures, and that's a good way. You know, if you really want to get the full experience, find some Bigfoot structures and then go camping next to them. Uh, that really increased the activity level uh, tenfold. But we we got up there and. This it was there was some lightning in the air. It was like this electrical activity, and then you have uh, we had a group of us that were there. At, one of them uh, was Robin Roberts from uh, Colorado, and she had her dog Rue with her. And normally I don't big I don't go squatching with dogs, but Rue is very uh, very in tune with all this sort of thing. But Rue was pretty freaked out uh, there. We had just found some. Was it the, the lightning? Do you think the lightning was bugging them, or do you think it was something else? Uh, no, it, uh, there was just a kind of a mild rain, and, and, and there was just kind of this, this energy in the air. But you get that when you're around, uh, you know, close to Bigfoot. But I actually thought with the, the, way, the, the, the way it was, um, the activity that it was happening, this kind of back end of the storm, just really almost emboldened the Bigfoot that were in the area because uh, they were coming real close uh, up to us uh, along the tree lines there. And about half the group that was up there with us decided not to spend the night after about an hour up there. It was, uh, I think, <laughs> they uh, they cited that it was the storm activity, but they headed back to camp. And I, you know, honestly, I do not blame anybody who decides not to spend a night out in the woods when they're when when it's that intimidating. Uh, they clearly, um, uh, we were in an area where the, we had drove up to this uh, top of this ridge line. And it isn't very far from. Uh, we had talked about that uh, that picture that I had shown that was a big arch pointing to a mound. It was kind of that mm -hmm. burial mound. Well, this was not very far from that location. So there was a ton of activity in this area in the, in the past, and the, and that particular night it was very active. 
we had found some scat that had plums in it. And so we knew they were, you know, eating the plums in the area and they were present. Um, Robin uh, thought that that was bear scat, but I told her we don't have bear in, uh, on the Missouri River here in Nebraska. So uh, I definitely attributed that to the Bigfoot in the area. But yeah, about half the people left. So by uh, three in the morning, there was just a, about a handful of us that, that wound up spending the night out there. And things got real interesting. Um, I kind of back up a little bit. We were sitting in lawn chairs and, you know, we just sit in complete dark. Uh, the storm had kind of moved through. And so it was just, it had stopped raining and everything. And, and uh, we decided it was getting late. Let's, let's get to our tents. And so we all went and uh, got into our tent. Well, at uh, three in the morning, I'm, I'm, you know, got in my tent. I have another uh, researcher by me, Paul. And then a tent a little bit down from me on the other side was three ladies that were uh, staying there, and they um, had Rue the dog with them. And so we got just a group of about five of us were right there. Well, um, Barry was, he went down to camp, down to, to base camp, and he was going to come back later. He had to get a few things. And so I was sitting in my tent, and I, and, uh, I hooked up my recorder. Anytime I'm out in the bush, I always have recording equipment. You know, I, I try to gather as much information as I can. So I had in this little two-man tent, I had hanging uh, in, in the tent this recorder. And they had, it had just a little red light. Normally, I'll cover them up, but I didn't care. I just figured they're gonna, if they're going to come, they're going to come. Well, I was sitting there, and it was very still. You know, after a storm, sometimes it really just gets completely still. It was quiet. And I'm sitting there kind of fiddling with some other stuff I had, getting ready to, to lay down and kind of waiting to hear if Barry was coming. So I had my radio. All of a sudden, the uh, recorder I had hanging there starts swinging like a pendulum. And it starts Whoa. swinging back and forth. And so that caught my attention. I went, oh, okay, something's going on here. I look, and the wall to my tent, my tent starts moving in towards me. So oh, all cool. I have, uh, I didn't have a, normally I will have like a um, something, you know, I'll have, I usually have like a machete or corn knife or something if I'm, you know, cutting, if I'm going through some heavy bush. But I didn't have anything with me, and so I'm just sitting there. I thought, well, what the hell? So I took my hat, and I slapped that that wall that was moving towards me. I slapped it, and it, it, it kind of went back. It just kind of disappeared back, and it went back into form, and then the, the recorder stopped uh, moving around. And I thought, well, now isn't that interesting? Now, I don't have the, the greatest hearing or the greatest eyesight, mind you, but I'm, I'm all in when there's activity around me. So right. I thought, well, uh, that's crazy. A little while later, I hear this crash, crash, and a tree gets pushed down. So I'm going, whoa, this is start, things are starting to pick up. Um, I radioed to, to Barry to see if he's coming back up, and he, he is coming up. It took him a, another, about half hour after that happened. And my other buddy, Paul, he'd already crashed out. He was out of it. And, but I could hear the ladies were awake, so I knew they were still up. Well, I, um, when, when Barry got there, he radioed me, and I, the road wasn't too far up from us, but I showed my flashlight so he could find where I'm at. And he came in and, uh, and got in the tent, and it was about 4 in the morning, and he said, bro, he goes, man, there's, it feels intense here. Something's, something's not right. Something's going on. And I said, well, you know, things got real crazy <laughs> a little bit ago. Something was pushing on my tent, and my whole recorder was moving. We had a tree pushed down. Oh, so God. Barry gets his stuff. Uh, he, he was going to stay at another campsite, but everybody had went down uh, that was in his area. So I told him just to stay with me. I didn't want him to, have, you know, to stay over by himself. And so yeah, it he so, stayed. Sounds like Satago was right there where you were anyway. Why go somewhere else? Yeah, yeah. He didn't have to go anywhere. So. Uh, we're sitting there, and I was telling him, and, and uh, all of a sudden, Barry, you know, we're kind of sitting there, and Barry goes, uh, um, I hear, he, he goes, I can hear him. I said, who? And he goes, well, he's kind of an aggressive male, but uh, he comes up, up through these uh, ridges here, this ridge. I said, really? And he goes, I hear him howling. He goes, he's coming. I thought, oh, great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's coming. Okay. Uh, all right. Well. Uh, so we're we're sitting there, and I'm like, well, uh, I got to see what's 
you know, what's going to happen now? Well, a short time later, we hear this just thunderous wood knock. I mean, it had to have been two good-sized trees. I mean, a, a good-sized tree hitting a tree. I couldn't believe how loud it was. Right. And it was right down below us. And so Barry's like, he's here. He's here. And I was like, oh, shit. So I'm sitting there waiting, like, what is going to happen next? You know, this is – he's here, and obviously he's not happy we're here. So the next thing, uh, just about – Two, three minutes later, and I have all this recorded, obviously, it was on my recorder. I hear, we both of us hear another just thunderous, just, just loud. You, I mean, you could just feel the energy of this thing hitting another tree just a little bit away from there. It was like it was almost uh, one corner of where we were at and then the other corner. And, and then a little while later, and we're just sitting there listening, a third tree gets hit. This time it's on the other side of our tents. And Barry starts getting worried, and he goes, you know, uh, this isn't right. He goes, something, something's not right. He's very mad. You know, he's 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 mad at us. And I thought, oh well, you know, what are we gonna do? You know, I'd been up. It'd been all night. I was tired. But you know, when you got something like that going on, you're like, you know, you're yeah, you got plenty of adrenaline going at that point. <laughs> you know, I'd be yeah. just wondering what is it that's setting them off so much? What are we doing different that's pissing them off compared to what we usually do? Well, in this situation, uh, we were camped right in, like, by their structures and right in an area that normally we wouldn't camp in. Uh, uh-huh. we, okay, there you we go. Up there, not that I'm aware of anybody's ever camped up there. So this was in there. This was violating their space, I think, especially the alpha male. And he didn't – and we were right on top of, like, the structure literally was right next to my tent. Oh, God. <laughs> so yeah, okay. It was complete, yeah, this was, a, you know, this was, we're going in and we're going to try to get activity and we're going to push our, push our, you know. Uh, so then this fourth time it hit and it was just, it was like it had hit four corners all around our the tent area. And Barry's like, bro, we got to get up. We got to get everybody up. We got to go out and make a stand. He goes, this is not good. He goes, I never heard him do four times like that hard around the area. He goes, that. We got to get out, get up out of here. We got to call everybody up. So I, I shout over to my buddy Paul to get him up and the ladies, and we get them up. And it's about five in the morning, and uh, they, we all get out of our tent. We shine our light around. Uh, we didn't see anything, but uh, I start talking to the ladies, and it was uh, Robin and Tammy, and they were telling me that uh, as soon as uh, I got into my tent that the Bigfoot were walking around it. They were uh, throwing rocks at my tent. So oh, they could hear all this from their tent. They could he- literally hear all this stuff. And they said that, that it was really my – they were just coming up between our tents and walking around our tents. And so the one that – one must have got really close because he pushed right into the side of my tent that, that one time. And then they said that uh, that um, that they had heard some chatter and some rock clacking and stuff like that. So they were hearing all kinds of stuff. They they never did go to sleep. They were just you know they were there listening to all this. And so we shined our light around. We looked around. And nothing else happened. But Barry really felt we needed to make a presence. Like that was not okay for them. You know we're not going to let them push a tree over on us or something. So we wound up uh, going um, back to bed then shortly after. Uh, it must have been 5.30, almost 5.45, something like that. And we slept about an hour maybe before the sun came up. But I guess, you know, Barry and I were so tired, we started snoring. And the lady said every time we would snore, they would throw a rock at our tent. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, were, <laughs> they, were, they were little. It must have been little rocks because I was pretty tired. But uh, – they said every time one of us would snore, they would literally throw a rock right at our tent, and they could hear it. So they didn't, you know, they didn't want us there. Clearly, we had pushed our uh, limits, um, and you know, I don't know what would have happened if we wouldn't have, you know, got outside of our tent. Um, but that was pretty crazy. Um, I, I sent you some pictures of of the that morning when I got up. I took pictures of some structures and stuff around our camp area. So I sent you those pictures. You can post them, but there's like five of them, five or six of them. And uh, so that's pretty cool. That was a good story, uh, and that was just recent. Um, and, you know, th- those kind of things happen. You know, I didn't 
I was concerned. I've never, I've been on these sort of expeditions where I've had things thrown at me. One time uh, in Iowa, I was at Yellow River State Forest and we uh, separated, there was four of us, we separated on a trail and there was a ridge line above us. And we did wood knocks and whoops all just rapidly in between us. And we were a couple hundred yards away. It was complete dark. Um, and all of a sudden we see this branch come, uh, well, I could see up in the ridge line, I could see the classic rocking back and forth. You know, um, you're looking on a ridge line, you can see the trees. And then I see this large figure, dark figure, uh, walk, rocking back and forth between the trees. So I'm like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's promising. Maybe he'll come down here. Yeah. But he, you know what that not... is for sure. That's that's a <laughs> uh, a paranoid bear that's been drinking too much water with atrazine in it. No. Uh, <laughs> classic, uh, that classic Bigfoot behavior, the rocking yeah. uh, and yeah. being by trees and kind of, uh, they get, you know, I think they get nervous and they kind of, that, that's one of those self stem things. So they just kind of rock back and forth. It's very ape type behavior. Yeah. Um, but anyway, uh, they the thing is, we were separated. They like to keep people in a nice little group so they can keep an eye on everybody. All at once. <laughs> yeah, if you separate, people. they have to have a separate center that will follow each one of you around. That gets to be a real problem. That is. That is. And so we're standing there, and all of a sudden this branch comes flying down, a uh, pretty good-sized branch, and it lands right by our feet. And so I'm like, well, I guess it's time wow. to go. I think we've worn out our welcome here, so uh, we decided that was enough of that. Uh, I've seen the um, – also, um, when I was at Yellow River, we had a really good experience. We walked a two-track, which was right across uh, the stream from uh, – they had done a Finding Bigfoot episode just last year there. But this would have been, like, in 2014 when we first scouted that area. And it was Steve Moon, who's the researcher in Iowa, and Bob Barhite, who does the Wisconsin research – and there with the BFRO, excellent investigators. We were, myself and uh, my friend Paul, uh, we were hiking this two track on the side of this uh, creek that leads up to a ridge line. Well, we were walking very quiet and um, we came up to what looked like there was some uh, eye glow um, coming up kind of off the creek bed. So we stood there and sure enough, about 15 yards from us. Now this two track had nothing it was just a straight kind of two-track road that followed along the straight portion of this creek. And there was no uh, other trees or anything that could be in the way, no lights or anything. So we knew it was just complete dark there. But what happened is this Bigfoot stepped up on the, the two-track, turned, and its eyes were glowing, uh, kind of a, a whitish, uh, amberish kind of color. And it was, it turned and looked at us, and as soon as it saw us, those eyes got really bright and big, like it was surprised, and almost cartoonish. And we couldn't see, you know, it's weird, because you'd expect to see the whole outline or something with an illuminated eyes like that, but right. all you could see is these eyes. You just see these huge eyes, and it was a good eight or nine feet uh, tall, and it was right, like, you know, within 15 yards of us, right out in front of us. And... Uh, you know, it's pitch dark out, but its eyes just got huge, just glowed. It turned and then went straight up a ridge, uh, ridge line, um, just totally walked. They can, they can ascend just the steepest uh, ridge that we wouldn't even begin to try to, to, to enter in, but it just went and ascended that and disappeared. But that was pretty damn cool. I mean, that was right out in the open, probably 15 yards right, right there, uh, right in front of me. Um, again, I couldn't see the total, um, the, the whole, you know, it was a whole daylight sighting. The only time I really saw a good uh, a view of one that was just really a partial view was when we were on a, we, we pulled into an alfalfa field and uh, we had just parked, and this was on the Omaha Reds, it was probably two years, two or three years ago, and there had been a lot of activity near this abandoned house. And so they had they had tried to do they tried to do a haunted house in there, and they had uh, they got scared out of there. Uh, so we went, <laughs> yeah. So we we go back there to go confront. Apparently, uh, Barry wanted us to confront them to tell them that was not acceptable. So we brought uh, myself and Paul along. 
So we pull up there, and as soon as we pull up, and this is one of the reasons why I now carry uh, in my vehicle, I have a uh, one of those dash cams because, you know, there's so many times they'll you'll pull into an area and they might walk by or do something, and if you had had a camera running, you could have saw it. You see a lot of them on, you know, like uh, police cruisers and stuff, you'll see that. So yeah. I really yeah. encourage people, if you're going to, you know, it's a fairly cheap investment, get a dash cam and have that running whenever you're out. It's, it's a good way to kind of – uh, to catch something. But anyway, we didn't have one running, but as soon as we pulled in there, the lights kind of shone into the timber, and I see this huge red matted hair. It's a leg and part of a body, like part of the buttocks. It must have just kind of it was crouching and turned and went up into the timber. And Barry was sitting behind me, and I was like, Barry, did you see that? He goes, yeah, bro, I saw that. And so I'm like, okay, and that was a Bigfoot, and that was really cool because it had red hair, but, you know, a lot of times people will talk about they, their hair looks really fine or it's not very long. Well, this was kind of longer, probably six to eight inches, and it was matted, like like dreadlocks almost, but just, just a gnarly matted uh, hair, you know. Like it, it hadn't really taken care of itself, and it just uh, – it would just go through those those brambles and weeds, and it just kind of make its hair, you know, matted, and that's what that's what this looked like to me. So uh, that that was different. It was all it was reddish brown, very clear. I could see that. I didn't see its face, but I could clearly see that it was, uh, you know, physically a good size reddish uh, hair. And so we went up in there. So yeah, let's let's not stop here. Let's go in the dark where it's hanging out. So we see it. Because he won't mind that. He'll welcome us with open arms. Oh, certainly, certainly. And so we go up in there. Uh, we walk in there probably a couple hundred yards, get up into the timber. It's completely dark. We don't have flashlights or anything. Oh, God. And, and Barry's talking talking to it. And then and then he decides that, um, well, let's, let's play peekaboo and see if we can get a reaction. So we have these little flashlights in our pocket. We pull those out. We go by a tree. Right now, I'm looking back at this. This was pretty crazy, and most people will probably think it is. But we would peek around the tree and shine our face and say peekaboo and see if they would come get any reaction from them. Well, uh, I think that just pissed them off because <laughs> because we were wound up getting underneath uh, one of his this huge structure. There's like two trees that were put together, and we called it like his di- his living room or something like that. And we were standing in there, and we're all kind of talking and thinking, well, you know, how are we going to get a reaction out of this guy? You know, obviously he's not responding to some of the stuff we're doing. Um, we know he's here. Clearly we just saw him. Well, we're standing there. All of a sudden these these trees start just shaking and moving, and everybody looks at each other and is like, did you do that? No, did you do that? It wouldn't even be possible for us to move two huge trees. This whole thing started shaking above us and we're like oh hell no so uh-huh. that is the point we decide we're it's time to leave and so we kind of backed it up out of there and left he did not yell or do anything like that we couldn't get any a verbal thing from him but uh that was kind of a that was that was a hair raising experience and um that took a little guts to go up in there and do that so i've you know i've, I've got had a lot of great experiences i've been very close to them um I've seen a lot of there. When we get to the eye glow pictures that I'll show later, I'll go into a little more detail about that. But um, I've typically, when I've done research at night, I've gone out into the dark, and and your eyes adjust. You just have to know the trails you get into before you go. And once you start walking those trails, you'll start. If you're in an area where Bigfoot are, uh, Barry has been doing a uh, a really light whoop. It's a it's a um, it's not a heavy whoop like you'll hear people using a real heavy whoop. It's very light whoop, and that seems to be very good. Uh, that's gotten a lot of attention each time we've done that. So uh, I think, you know, you got to mix it up when you're doing research because they, uh, unless you got a habituation site, um, you know, and you're doing that there all the time, you're, you're getting with different groups of Bigfoot, so you got to kind of mix it up to try to get their attention. But those are just some of the experiences that I had. And then, I wanted to share one more, if I could, uh, Go ahead. And, from, from the expedition, uh, and this one's pretty good. I, I included some pictures of it uh, in the pictures I sent you, and they are uh, they're very dark pictures, but they have fingerprints on them. Um, 
the second night we were there, a um, the we were down in Big Elk uh, Campground, and there was a um, it was it's hunting you know, it's deer season, so there was some hunters that were there, and we talked to them, and we told them where we were going to be and where they were going to be, and so we were all on the same page. But uh, what I thought was interesting, we had a guy, uh, this Terry and Elby, who was one of the uh, rest watching, they had went into town and they came back about 10 o'clock and they're, they're, as they pulled in where the cabins are, their light shone on a huge alpha male. And oh God. They, they explained that this guy had to be as tall as the peak of the actual cabins that we were in, which is about 11 to 12 feet tall which is hard for people to believe, but an alpha male is very wow. big, and he is not seen hardly ever. The only the ones that are normally seen, eight or nine foot tall ones, are typically the young males or yeah. uh, female or betas, something. Betas the and ones. sentinels, which you usually see, and yeah, the little, the, uh, the teeny bopper uh, gangbanger ones that are like teenagers that are six, seven feet tall, and then the subordinate uh sub adults that are you know eight or so more or bigger but you're right because the the big ones don't need to make their presence known they got all the little minions running around taking care of all that stuff to keep humans away from them and uh you know they they don't make stupid mistakes if you see yeah. one you know it's like it's showing <laughs> it's showing itself to you and you're in big big trouble get out of here yeah. Well, this this particular, I think I realized it all made sense to me why this happened. And but one of the descriptions they gave it, it was big and gray, and it, easily as tall as the peak of the cabin there. And they had that for reference. So you know, I was uh, they were they were they pulled in. And but what is interesting, their description was that he took one step into the timber, and he disappeared. But his butt, and it would be, you know, from their reference point, they, they were sitting in a vehicle. They could, they were basically dead with his, dead square with his, where his rear end was. They could see that. That would be a prominent thing they would see. He, ex he explained to me that it looked like an elephant's butt as it stepped <laughs> into the timber. That's how big oh, it was. Yeah. It was huge. And so that tells me, you know, these people really saw one because that's just not something you're going to, you know, put out there as a you know to explain something unless you that's the only reference you have something that size uh, yeah. literally one step into the timber he was gone uh the following night um and i we all went over and checked that out and uh you know there certainly was a smell there there was a people people that went back into that timber that was an area where i'd had rock thrown at my trail camera before i got city I got video of them setting off my trail camera. The only time they, that my trail camera went off was when they just was three times in one night, and the two times that it went off was when these rocks were thrown. And I know it wasn't wind or anything because it was very still, and it was the middle of winter, so there was no mm -hmm. bugs flying around or nothing right. like that. Uh, right. So I know they were setting it off, and there's these arcs. You can see an arc coming in there. Anyway, that was right in that area. But the following night, uh, this was just behind the, the cabins. And and I believe this is why I believe the big guy was there. You've got all of these deer hunters coming in and they I don't know, they there's probably, you know, ten or more deer that are gonna be taken out of there in a given week and they leave gut piles. And we know that that uh that Sasquatch loves the soft uh organs and that's yeah. some of their that's a delicacy for a so the big guy is waiting around for those gut piles. And he's going to go clean up. And he doesn't expect Bigfoot people to be uh, looking for him there. <laughs> and so we caught him at the uh, dinner table trying to wait around for these hunters to, to leave their gut piles. And he was going to go in there and clean that up. And he did not expect us to be there actually paying attention. And, and you know, he's used to hunters not, not having any clue that there would be something out there. So um, right. so I think that's that's why he was caught out off guard. But the following right. night, we were at the campfire, and these pictures that I sent you, they're not too great, but they are a picture of the alarm of this of this guy's car went off, Terry. And we were sitting at the campfire, and his car was parked exactly where he had been the night before when he, when he had seen the big guy. Well, his car alarm went off. And so we're like, oh, I bet he's throwing rocks at your car, you know. And so we all go over there to take a look at it, and... Uh, we found 
uh, fingerprints on his vehicle because it was real dusty. Oh, and we have, I took pictures of it, the pictures that I sent, uh, you, you can post. But they have one of the, on his right hand, he had just like his front of his digits, just the fingertips, fingertips would be down. Those were quarter size, size of a quarter, just his fingertips. His hand, where he had his hand, his fingers were as wide as a Twinkie. This guy was huge. And so that corroborates to me that he was every bit 11 or 12 feet when his yeah. fingertips were the size of a quarter and his hand was probably a foot long with these finger uh, fingers being as wide as Twinkies. So oh, God. that corroborated that, uh, that the big guy was around and he was checking us out and he was trying to hide behind that car and, that didn't go very well when the alarm went off. But anyway, <laughs> just some uh, some stories just just recent uh, class A sighting and uh, you know and so if, I hope that kind of uh, hits the hits that mark for some people who want to just hear some real you know stories of Bigfoot. I, I still have quite a, you know I got other stories obviously so but those were some recent ones and some pretty good ones. Pretty cool. Nice. So. You know, you, you touched on a couple of things here. I want to go back to to one of them, and if you're willing to comment on it, even that the one yeah. you were in that uh, Finding Bigfoot had done uh, an episode there, and as far as I understand, they're pretty well done at this point. Um, do you feel like commenting on them at all? Um, you know, I got I I'm a member of the BFRO, and I got into um, uh, into this. I was obviously I was into Bigfooting long before the FRO exists existed just as a kid, just curiosity. Just like you know, most of the people who were probably listening to this saw the the Patterson Gimlin uh video and was hooked ever since. But and my grandmother used to send me, you know, uh um just clippings back in the seventies from South Dakota. I live in Nebraska, but uh she would send me clippings of sightings and stuff. So I was just always into it. Um, but I got into it um, with the BFRO as far as doing these expeditions and doing research. So, you know, I I, I have um, some mixed feelings on all that because it really connected me to some great people. But also knowing how these TV shows are now, that I think, wasn't it Michael Cook said it's about 40, 60? That it's about, you know, what is it, 40, 60% accurate and 40% uh, made for TV? You get some kind of combination like that, uh, and I think that's probably true with what they were doing with finding Bigfoot. They unfortunately they didn't have a lot of the hard evidence that I would have liked to have seen. Um, uh, I know those guys are, are have casted a ton of footprints and all that, and had a lot of great experience. Um, but like a lot of the expeditions I've been on, this whole thing with the structures, they they really never uh, addressed that issue. Nope. Um, they never, and that to me is kind of a fundamental thing to Bigfooting. So, um, you know, and then they they took down the Blue Forum, which we had a lot of investigators and researchers in the BFRO were able to make comments and stuff. And I guess they want everybody on Facebook now. But uh, the show itself, you know, it was entertaining. I think a lot of us watched it every week. We were hoping for something more. They had some good, you know, some really good experiences that people were able to share. I think it allows people to report these in a manner now. They have a place where they can report them. But did they find Bigfoot? Uh, not, it didn't appear too much. And even like the the Yellow River State Forest episode that they had, um, there was so much activity we've had there and a lot of stuff, you know. But, but the thing is when you bring in a lot of people and you have cameramen and all that, you know, it's it's just kind of counterintuitive to, big, to squatching because that's, really not what the Bigfoot are going to engage in. So, right. you know, it's a tough but situation. See, this brings me to my point, though, that I was going to make, which is why weren't they showing all this secondary stuff instead of wasting time hooping and hollering and walking around in the dark and going, snap, oh, that must have been a Bigfoot. Why aren't they wandering <laughs> around in the woods during the day getting pictures of tracks and tree structures? There's your friggin' evidence. Whether you find yeah. one and get video of it when you're in that specific location or not, there's secondary evidence there. And if you actually know what the hell you're doing, how come you're not finding it? And why couldn't that be put on the show? Basically, I, I don't buy it. I love yeah. the fact that they got uh, 
a lot of visibility for the whole Bigfooting thing and made it more accessible for the average person and for people that had sightings or something that now probably feel a lot more like they can talk to somebody about it and not just get immediately ridiculed. There might be somebody who would listen to it, and that's all good. But the methodology they were using was, uh, you know, from my standpoint, ridiculous, guaranteed to fail. <laughs> And it almost made me wonder if, like, you know, the textbook de definition of insanity is doing something that miserably fails and doing it over and over and over again, thinking there's going to be a different result. So yeah. me, either they're, like, completely crazy or they're actually teaching everyone the Im impossibly wrong way to squatch where you're guaranteed to never see one, and so no greenies are going to go into the woods and get accidentally killed because they're definitely not going to find one. Yeah, and I can tell you, you know, it's not that damn difficult. You know, they make it seem a lot harder than it really is. If you're exactly. in the signs to look for, uh, you're going to be in the woods with them, and they're going to come check you out. It's not a matter of you finding Bigfoot. It's Bigfoot finding you. That's right. how that works. <laughs> so, so even if you got a big crew, I, you park the crew in a big clearing over here, you get a couple of the guys in one camera, and you go over here by a tree structure, and you camp there overnight, and you have all kinds of things happen, and maybe even get some footage of one, which they never even did that one friggin' time. So I guess the point that I'm trying to get to here is either they're incredibly ignorant, or they're obfuscating on purpose. Yeah, and they're, you know, I, I, I really, like I said, I know a lot of great people in the VFRO, and um, they're, the research they're doing is very sound. Um, mm. As for having a producer coming in and making, uh, a, you know, a weekly entertaining, uh, you know, I, you can't even, it's not even a documentary, it's an entertainment show, and right. having them state that and how they're going to do it, I think, is what what we're what we've seen is not not successful as far as uh, the research end no. of it. It's not, but it's what not I'm saying, even even from you know, not just putting all that aside, just put all pure research aside and say the show is just sheer entertainment. What's the entertaining part of the show? As it actually went 90% of the time, it was the town hall meeting, people telling their encounters. And why was that the high point of the show? Because they never friggin' found anything. So if you actually had their butts out there finding tree structures, documenting that, camping next to one, getting logs thrown at them, having, you know, T-Rex calls happening, would have been way the hell more exciting, huh? Yeah, and I, I completely agree. And I'll tell you, all of the BFRO expeditions I've been on, I have a reported, I always write up a report, and I included pictures of structures, and I know many of other uh, researchers have done that, and we've included that in our reports because we've always had a you always have a kind of a group report when you're done with that. And over the years, we've always done that. Had every area from the Dallas Caldera area where I was at, and up into um, Pike National Forest and Yellow River State Forest, and then obviously uh, it wasn't a BFRO expedition, but up in Montana when we were there, we took a ton of structures. So I yeah. always shared that on, and then they were always on. They were shared as a part of the internal uh, process uh, of investigation stuff, but why that never made uh, made it out to um, uh, the public is a whole nother, you know, a whole nother side of it that I just am not privy to, and I don't know why that is. Yeah. And, and again, to me, it just looks like they're trying to make sure that this whole part of it is excluded so that the public does not have the tools to actually find where these things are and interact with them. Yeah, and that that's that's one of the reasons why I have my own website. And when I started my own website and my own repository, because of that exact thing, uh, we I can give my opinion and tell people what I think and where to find them and how to find them. And I I think I'm giving very good information. And right. it's actually going to you're going to find Bigfoot if you follow the things that I'm telling you and what we're talking about here today. So, right. yeah, it's, you know, I when it comes to TV, I just, you know, there's so much of it anymore. Is it, you just don't know what, you, what you, it's, it's all has to be considered entertainment. There's just right. no real value to it for research. If you're going to go, if you want to, uh, you know, get into this and get close experiences with them, um, you know, look at the stuff that we're doing and, and what other researchers who 
who are probably doing independent things. You get into a big hierarchy, and it's it's tough, you know. Yeah. And, and speaking of that big on. hierarchy, and leaving the whole show and the entertainment part of it aside, because before the show there was a BFRO, and there's still the BFRO, the Bigfoot Field Research Organization, with researchers yeah. in every state and all over the damn place. And they all, you know, get reports and share information. In some states, they're super awesome. They're way on top of it. In other states, they're real slackers, and you can wait nine months before they even call you back to go get a report from you. And uh, I've actually talked to a bunch of researchers now that were formerly with the BFRO and will not work with them anymore. And every single one of them told me the reason was is because they felt like the BFRO was running an agenda. And certain things that they would report, they just wouldn't even take it that way. They'd make them rewrite the report or they wouldn't file it or whatever because um, they, like, had an opinion. And if anything deviated beyond that, they didn't want to hear about it. Yeah, and I know, you know, all of that stuff is volunteer. You know, people – there is there is a lot of – you know, in every state, they, there's pretty much investigators, and they're all volunteering. So Right. You know, they're I, not getting it, paid for it. That's, you know yeah. – Absolutely. They're doing this because they love it and they want to help people and they're interested in doing it. They're not getting yeah. paid. They're just volunteers. So stress that right out the gate. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to be on top of it. They're not getting a paycheck. But they're volunteering to be part of it and they're trying. So that's why you get, the, you know, some states you've got more BFRO guys and less sightings, so they're more on top of it or whatever. But my point is, is that, you know, these guys are actually – telling me that they left the BFRO because they don't think the BFRO is being honest about the reports they were accepting. Well, and that's, again, that's kind of why I uh, have my own website and my own repository because I, I feel like, I, you know, I was able to put my own information of my research out there that might not have gotten uh, shared uh, at a greater public uh, display through through some of the research methods that they have. And the one thing is, the uh, the public forum that they did have, where we did get to share a lot of this information, I had, you know, I had poll, I had a poll on there whether people believe they had uh, more than one offspring, like they had twins, twins or several offspring, which I believe they do, just like a bear or a deer. Uh, there's more than enough evidence that points to that. There was some, I had the European contagion theory on the BFRO forum, and that was vetted out there very well. A lot of great feedback about the Native American history of that. So. Uh, there were some good things that came out of it, but what was right. where it went, it, it just didn't end up going anywhere. It just, mm -hmm. and a matter of fact, the forum is gone. So all of that, uh, those contributions that were put on there are no longer even public. Right. And so that's, that is in itself, I was very unhappy about that. And, but that's kind of pushed me into to where I'm at today. I mean, like I joined Facebook and joined some of these other groups where I previously wouldn't have been on that. So Right. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, you, I definitely see 100% where you're coming from, Duke, and I know I've heard the same thing from other investigators, and that's why, you know, I do a lot with res squatching because not only um, is is it's I don't have to be concerned about an organizational thing, but I don't have to worry about the park system kicking me out at night, you know. Right. I don't have to worry about all this other stuff. I can and go you've, on had, the you've had that happen too, right? You mentioned that briefly last time, where oh, you actually yeah. been on nighttime stakeouts and <laughs> show. You would tell us one of those stories. Yeah, we were uh, we were in uh, in Iowa, and uh, we were on a on a um, it was it was a private expedition, and it was in a um, it was in an area that is kind of in the Solarian Escarpments, which is. Uh, it's a uh, it's in a part of Iowa that has some unique uh, landscape from glacial uh, the glacial kind of a glacial till glacial line. gouging yeah <laughs> yeah deep deep canyons with uh, clear streams and it's perfect uh, and when I talk about karst systems later this would be a, this is a karst system there's the state systems with, made by water uh, wet and dry caves. Anyway, while we're in there, we're in there in the middle of the night, uh, and probably two in the morning or so. Might not even been that late. Might have been about one. And a group of us, about four of us, are kind of spread out. Uh, one with clear camera and clear, and I had, I think, a parabolic, and we're all kind of standing around. And all of a sudden, the light lights come in around the corner, and it's the it's the park ranger, and what? he's got us out in the open, and we're like. 
hi, how are you doing? We couldn't hide it. You know, you're not going to stuff a, a parabolic in your pocket. Uh, you're just, you're, you're hot right out, red-handed out in the open. And he goes, what are you guys doing in here? And we're going, oh, yeah, we're just kind of doing a little night research here. And he goes, well, you can't be in here after dark. You're going to have to leave, you know. So he asked us kindly to leave. We didn't get a ticket or anything. Although it does say you're not supposed to be in there after dark. Uh, well, do you think he, he thought you guys were like, uh, you know, shiny deer or something, and he was trying to get the drop on you, and then, or do you think he knew uh, what you were up to? I think he probably knew what we were up to. Um, it, it. I don't think it would be very surprising for anybody who worked in one of these parks to have a lot of encounters and have a lot of yeah. strange stuff going on. And uh, I think they, that's one of the reasons why they enforce this. They don't want anybody out here to, to shed light on that or to have those experiences. You know, that's yeah. why they close these parks up at night. Well, uh, and it could yeah. be, you know, it's, it could be just as something as simple as let's give them the benefit of the doubt here. It could be a safety issue. We don't want to announce these things exist, but we don't want people getting mangled by them. We'll just make this off limits at night so that people don't go in here and, and kick them off and get, you know, chucked up into the crotch of a tree 30 feet in the air to be found sometime later. Exactly, exactly. They don't want that, you know, and and you know how rules get made. There's generally there's somebody has a good intention and all the other consequences that come along with it aren't necessarily considered until, you know, or, or, they, or they don't care. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you know, you know, wouldn't it be nice to be able to get a special um, license to be able to go out in the dark and squatch at night in certain areas? You know, they're not going to. They're not going to give you that. So no. Uh, that kind of shuts the door on that. And what we have seen also, I heard this from uh, uh, Jerry Ulrich, who was an old time researcher in Iowa. He's had experiences back forty some years, and he told me that what happens is typically a park they'll turn it into a wildlife management area, and then just kind of shut it down altogether. Uh, yeah. They won't even let people camp there anymore if there's a lot of Bigfoot acti activity. So uh, this has been a, a consorted effort, I think, for many years. Most of the park systems are uh, federal for sure, uh, are aware of this, and, they're, and they have their ways of dealing with it. And, um, you know, why it's a cover-up, I don't know. Um, but, you know, it's it certainly uh, – they, they certainly are preventing people from going out and having these experiences, without a doubt. Yeah, or doing their best to interfere with it anyway, which is, you know, fortunate out here once fire season is over and whatever forest is still left. Uh, it's just so gigantic that they just can't watch you all the time. If you don't tell them where you're going, how the hell are they going to know you're there, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and that's, that's a good reason why I, I do research with res watching. And, you know, if you're into – this sort of thing, uh, I, I encourage you to get in with the Native American uh, uh, researchers. They, they're excellent, and they generally uh, engage people. If you have a general interest, there there is that, that, that open for you to, to come and experience that. So uh, that's, that's one of the reasons why I do that. Uh, I, I drive two hours. I don't have to drive two hours. I can have uh, experiences closer to me. But I just don't want to deal with the hassle of all the other stuff that goes along with that, where I can drive two hours and camp in an area, and, uh, you know, I don't have to uh, worry about anybody telling me that I, you know, shouldn't be here or have to leave right. or something. Except for Bigfoot, who will show up and tell you you shouldn't be there <laughs> yeah. and have to leave. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a whole other, but I guess that's what we try to, try to do. So, so yeah, yeah. Some, those are some stories, you know, and those are, uh, you know, that's pretty entertaining stuff. That makes it exciting to go out and do this. You know, I guess when you get in this, you're, I, I didn't realize, I guess, I was uh, an adrenaline junkie until I got into squatching. So I was yeah. in denial many years, apparently. But uh, that's that. That's ultimately uh, you get into this and you, you're drawn to it. And those experiences become addictive and you get back out there. You know, I've seen Bigfoot. I know they exist many times. Uh, and I don't, um, I don't have to go looking anymore. I, I found what I was looking for, but the yeah. adrenaline side of it, uh, I think is what got me now and having, having one push in my tent and, uh, you know, throw rocks at me and that sort of thing. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that, that's, that's something that's, that's something that's hard to walk away from. Kind of interesting because it's, uh, 
my situation, I've had, again, multiple encounters. I've seen him up close three times, twice during the day. And <laughs> Sentinel screwed up and thought he was going to pass himself off as a stump. That didn't work. Ha uh-huh. <laughs> But, uh, <laughs> you know, the other one showed me uh, himself on purpose. And uh, the third one that I saw at night, I almost walked into. But I've had him right up messing with my tent before. You know, you get up in the morning and there's a 19-inch track, like four inches from your rain fly. <laughs> now, this thing was standing like less than two feet from my head last night. Or they shake your tent uh-huh. a couple times or something like that. And it just got to the point with me where it was like, I, I, don't, I don't want to see him. I'm not interested in seeing him. I'm not trying to attract <laughs> him in. I don't want to see him. I don't want to get a picture of him. I don't want to get film with him. No. None of that. I go to where they're at because I want to get secondary information. I'm really interested in what the tree structures signify and what they're marking. See, that's what I'm looking at right now. And, uh, you know, then you find tracks and you can document those and maybe one's in the mud so you can get dermal ridges and that's worth casting and stuff like that. But as far as like, you know, and I'd like I'd like to record more vocalizations and sounds and stuff, you know, because that's a real easy to do thing out here too. But as far mm-hmm. as like actually seeing them and interacting with them, <laughs> no way. Yeah. Not interested. Stay away from me. You guys are scary. <laughs> it is it, that is, and that's that. You know, you get scared to death, uh, but it is something that still draws people into it. And also, that I love the research side of it. I mean, I really, I, I wouldn't need to attend a conference. I've been to some conferences, but for me, just to go out in the bush and research them, and and find these tracks, and find the the structures, and and have that experience where I've recorded recorded some wood knocks that I'm going to go back now and, and isolate that. Uh, those, that, that's, that's to me is what I enjoy about it. And, um, so I agree with you There there is the research end of it can be just never ending because there's always that new experience that you can try yeah. to record a, a howl and or by, something. By no means do we have everything about these guys figured out at this point. I mean, we've just gotten to the point where we started to figure out that, hey, there's more than one kind of these things running around out there, too. And they don't act the same. So there's, like, a long ways that we can go with research on these things, too. And we need boots on the ground out in the field actually doing research and, you know, being, like, scientific about how you're vetting this stuff, too. You know, we were talking in the tree structure show last time about if you start seeing these patterns, keep looking and seeing if you're, you know, seeing them more. And then it starts building up a picture, like we were saying with the X structures. Those really seem like territorial markers, and that's what they're doing with them. And, well, how did we figure that out? Because we're finding them all over the place, and we keep looking at what they are in relation to everything else. So that's, you know, how we figure this stuff out. How do we, how, do, how is it that we think that tree snaps are trail markers? Well, because if you go in the direction that one's pointing, there's something else there. You know, all, all it takes is boots on the ground actually investigating this stuff and trying to be rational about it and figure out what the purpose for these things are. Because, you know, for a lot of them, there probably is a purpose, if not all of them. Uh, and we just yeah. got to figure out what it is. And that takes time and effort. And you're not going to get that by sitting there in a the library reading a book or watching friggin' Finding Bigfoot. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I agree 100% with you. Uh, you've got to get out and do it. And it is kind of funny when you were talking about, you know, you don't want you don't want to see them, don't need that experience anymore. Um, as I was doing a lot of expeditions in areas, I got to the point where I would take a zip tie and zip tie my uh, tent uh, zipper so it couldn't be opened up at night. Uh, <laughs> and when you wake up and you sit up in your tent and both sides of your tent are hitting you in the head alternately because something's got the top of your tent and is furiously whacking it back and forth, it's a little disconcerting. You're not really certain you want to have an experience like that again. I, I completely agree. Uh, that, that, you know, that's, <laughs> that you're out yeah, that there. Was, and that's, that was that's in crazy. Coloma where we were afraid there was a mountain giant around, so that was even creepier than usual too. So. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's all it's all good stuff. It's uh, it's been very entertaining, and uh, the re- research end of it continues for me. And some of the stuff we'll be talking about here uh, that I'll be pre- talking about this European contagion theory, all of that is just kind of built over the years of the right. research that we're doing. And um, I think we're starting to connect the dots to a lot of this. And the the um, when we start looking at historical uh, reference to to Bigfoot uh, in this country and then over in Europe, the wood booths, we'll, we'll, I think we could, I've got a pretty good idea of what's happened there. And I think I could um, 
can explain a lot of why there were these uh, different epochs in history. So, um, Well, let's get into yeah. that next then. You know, that's something that I noticed a long time ago, too. I grew up around the area of the Great Lakes, and uh, it seemed like if you went back in legend, especially with the uh, the older native tribes, where they're talking about the little people of the woods and the giants and uh, the Bigfoot and the Wendigo and all these sorts of northern cryptids that were running around up there, it seems to sort of come to, if not a screeching halt, it gets a lot less the more the, the white man penetrated into the area. And the first people that were picking up these reports, of course, were the fur trappers that were in the area who were mostly French and very superstitious and were adding elements on top of the stories they were getting. Naughty, naughty, bad French. And then there was the uh, the equally as superstitious lumberjacks came next, did the same thing. But after that time period, it seemed like the amount of sightings and reports and stuff lessened a whole lot. Now, interestingly, you had sort of the same thing happening over on the West Coast. And if you go back even further in Native legend, it sounds like right about the time that white man showed up originally, and there was a huge contagious disease outbreak that spread through North America and wiped out literally millions of the natives, that it might have wiped out literally tens of thousands of Bigfoot at the same time. And so that leads us back in time to go, well, wait a minute, there used to be Bigfoot in Europe. There was lots of reports up until a certain time period. And take it away, Rich. <laughs> yeah, uh, that, that is true. And that's, that's kind of what led, led me to this. When I first started uh, doing the research on this, I uh, had posted something on the uh, the BFRO forum and and that the about this idea of a European contagion theory that there were uh, that they had affected the population of Bigfoot just as they did Native American, and it was brought to my attention that there is a, a pretty good a lot of stories in the Native American culture of of this sort of thing happening like before. White man came, they would see Bigfoot up and down a, a salmon stream, and then after the white man came, you didn't see him anymore. And so mm -hmm. I, I had taken a lot of this information, and I thought that was really good. I think the, the Native Americans had done very well with sharing that um, information through stories, but there, there needed to be more to it. And I knew um, after that, then I tried to find out, I know and John Green had written a book, uh, the apes, uh, Sasquatch, the apes among us, and I actually had the opportunity to I'd interview him about this, and I tried to uh, contact him uh, to to talk about one of the stories in his book about uh, uh, potential for this before and after epoch, and and what he had heard because this he had had a story in one of his books that that outlined that that story I just talked about, the uh, up and down the river, uh, the salmon run and seeing Bigfoot before and, and not seeing him after the smallpox. So I thought, you know, I need to, need to have evidence. We, not, we need to have corroborating evidence to build a, a, a real theory. And I, I was given his number, and it was in 2015 I went to contact him. His wife had just passed away, and I was unable to have a conversation with him, so I did not get to interview him. And then he he died the following year, and so that was something that I never got a chance to to, to really follow up on some of the stories. Uh, if if you haven't read any of John Green's books, they're excellent. He just has tons of, of stories that today still shed light on on Bigfoot and the the evolving understanding that we have of Bigfoot. Uh, I I still look back at some of the stories I read uh, in his books and and refer to them in my website as far as some of the the, the modern research we're doing, but. Uh, so you know, hey, chance. before we go on anymore, i got to mention that uh, Bear just brought that book up a few episodes ago when he was on and also heavily recommends it as a resource for people that are into actually doing boots-on-the-ground type field research. And to digress just a little bit further, and this brings up a quick story I want you to mention, that uh, John in that book mentioned that he had collected reports of things that he thought were sort of outside of the realm of Bigfoot, and I sort of give mm -hmm. him credit for being one of the first people that was collecting mountain giant reports without realizing it, and going, these aren't Bigfoot, what the hell are these things? And yeah, that was yeah. about as far as he got with it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right, and you got to give him credit for that, because he didn't just discard those and throw them away, he included them, he still wrote them down, and yeah. made those public record so that sometime in the future you and I can talk about this. And right. so I give him a ton of credit for 
you know, he he is he he is one of the pioneers, definitely, in the whole uh, of documenting and researching uh, the phenomenon of, of Bigfoot, and and certainly some of the areas we still don't understand. He he's gotten some good stories that we think, you know, he didn't. You can tell at the time he didn't really know what to think of these things, but he still wrote it down, and and so that was important. So I, yep. you know, I started off there. I realized there was there was Native American uh, uh, um, um, verbal uh, stories that were spoken about uh, this epoch of before and after. So I knew there was something there. So I started doing more research, and what I was able to basically come up with is the European contagion theory, which which is what I've come up with my own name for this, is that. Um, it, you, you go over to Europe now, and you can look at the plague. And so I applied it to the same thing. In Europe, you have the wood woos was on uh, many of the churches. You have um, fight in the forest, which is a famous painting in Germany. Um, it's, a, it's like a sketch. It's like a pencil uh, etching, and you we've seen that. I think you've had that before. Um, you see um, on in, in yeah, France, that was supposed to be 1500s Black Forest. The knight yeah. that had the fight with the monster in the forest actually commissioned the artist to draw it, and he oversaw it to make sure that it was exactly what he saw. And then he had copies yeah. of it, made, gave it to his friends sort of like his mementos, and that's the only reason we've still got that thing floating around to look at. There it is, 500 years ago, a, a knight fought a Bigfoot in the Black Forest, if you believe him. Yeah, and, and this Bigfoot was holding on to the tree and has one foot on the tree, very characteristic behavior. The other thing that's interesting about the Bigfoot in this in that picture is it's very human looking in its face. And you know, if this guy took a certain interest in making sure that this was done correctly, he would have put it ape like if it looked ape like. He would have made sure those details were uh, written were made in a way. And so that's something I'll come back to when I, once I talk about some of the the, the genetics of, of why I think that, that we have this occurring this this that they were susceptible to diseases. But that's that's a great example. So here in Europe, you have them on churches. You have uh, there was in France, and I, I'll probably murder this, but it was I think it was the Baja Juan or something like that. But it was essentially called the King of the Forest. But it was the same sort of thing. It was a Bigfoot. It was in the the uh, the French Alps, and and they had all kinds of writing. I think that was in the Basque region that they called it that, the King King of the Forest. So. Yeah, Another well, quick digression history. here. I got to I got to bring this one up because you're bringing up the history right now, and you might not know this one. They have like lots of fragments of old pieces of paperwork that they just kind of keep for yeah, whatever King so and so wrote this. It's historical. Let's keep it. And some of that stuff is coming back to kind of bite them right now because there's still old documents from like the high medieval period from England, where the king would or some local you know high noble would send out an invitation. Hey, we're going hunting this weekend. All the other nobles in the area are invited, and here's where we're hunting. And there's more than one example of this where they said, well, we haven't decided yet. We're either going to hunt this or wild man. And I think one was stagger wild man, the other one was boar wild man. So what uh -huh. What the hell are they talking about? <laughs> you know, and, yeah, it, it, yeah. And then later, later uh, after the plague and all that, and several hundred years later, uh, I think it was King Henry of England ordered the, the debasing or the, uh, the destruction of some of these wood on, uh, uh on the churches. So I included a picture of that. You see some of the ones that are on churches and are still there today, but some of them had their faces uh, taken off for whatever right. reason. They didn't want it to I know. But uh, to, to try to keep the, the thing going here with the contagion theory and just make this – to explain this to everybody what I'm, what I'm getting at – yeah. I know, I keep, I keep digressing you, but sorry, folks, it's worth it, because we need the background detail so you can, so you understand where we're coming from and why we have this wacky idea. And it, it's, yeah. I'll let, I'll let Rick, Rich take all the credit for it so everybody can say he's crazy. <laughs> but I totally agree with him. I think he's dead on on yeah. this one. But go ahead. And, I, you know, and, I, and I've done everything I can to base this with, with some scientific uh, um, facts, and the facts are – that these stories existed, these pencil drawings, these they're still on churches today, and very much similar to the native lore and the native uh, here in America of all of the names that they have everywhere in the whole region of the United States, they have names for Bigfoot. And so we have a, a same sort of thing was going on in Europe. Uh, 
And in Europe, then, the plague happened a few hundred years before it occurred here, uh, before the smallpox was brought here. And what, what was interesting is you have all of this, uh, these pencil etchings, these, these on the wood roofs, and then you lose about 50 million people in Europe to the plague. And what, what was interesting, so that's, a, that's one of the epochs. It's one of the two things that I uh, have, the two epochs that I point out, the plague in Europe and then the smallpox epidemic in, this, in, in America are two significant epochs that are before and after and why there is that detachment from what would be lore or what was fact. Now, Lioness, who uh, was a Swiss, Swiss uh, uh, botanist and scientist who came up with binomial nomenclature, which is a classification system for animals, had uh, the Homo ferris, which is the wild man. And he knew the difference between somebody who was living on the fringe of society and was maybe ostracized by that community and people took food out to them. He knew the difference between that and a whole other category of, of, of Homo uh, ferris or wild man. Uh, and he, Carol, he categorized yeah. that. This was the founder of our whole classification system, classified there being a Bigfoot. And he said <laughs> that they were, they were um, lived on the wilder regions and were, uh, his explanation that they, they did not speak, they were mute, but um, he said that they were covered in hair and they um, lived on these wilder regions and he called them Homo ferris. So uh, we have certainly plenty of evidence. I mean, he, he proved it. If you believe in the classification system, we have a, a binomial nomenclature. This is the man who found it, the Swiss uh, right. uh, scientist. So plenty Let of me things. go off on that one for a second, too. One of the oldest books on zoological classifications from the 1600s. Yeah. And I like to mention this occasionally is because at the time that they did this, they were just starting to – know that Australia existed. And they had gotten there and they were looking around there trying to classify the animals they found. And in the classification system, they had dragons listed. They said, oh, well, what are these lizards here? Let's look at them. Uh, let's see, they got a beard. Go back, check the zoological book. Yep, check, dragons got beards, da 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 So that's how Pagona Viticeps got named the bearded dragon because they found these lizards that had beards and went, well, according to classification, they're dragons, so that's, that's how they got their name. Now, also interestingly, the unicorn was listed as a real animal. But if you go back and you look at where that word came from, uh, what they were calling a unicorn at the time was a fairly well-known animal, uh, not necessarily in Europe but in other parts of the world, and they did know about it in Europe, and it was a rhinoceros. And they did not call a rhinoceros a rhinoceros until three, 400 years ago. Before that, they called it a unicorn. Ah. Interesting. So, yeah, you have to really, when you look at some of these old books, and like, well, they classified this as a real thing, but it didn't exist. Uh, well, unicorns, as we think of them, maybe didn't exist. But they were thinking a rhinoceros was a unicorn, and that's what they were calling a unicorn. So you got to be real careful about this stuff and really check what it is they were talking about and do your due diligence and research on this stuff before you can draw any hard and fast conclusions about them making up imaginary things or maybe they were calling something that was real a name that we now use for an imaginary thing. But just to let the folks know, the uh, thumbnail on this episode is from a tapestry from the 11th century from England, and it is a wood woes kidnapping a fair maiden. So there you go. There's some more for you. Go ahead, Rich. That, and that's, that's, that's perfect connection for this because what I'm going to get into next is we have these two epochs. We have that in, in Europe, the contagion of the plague, and then in the Americas, which uh, typically the, the Spanish had brought that about 500 years ago. There was a, the, the Native American population was at an all-time low. 5,000 years ago, they were at the all-time high. 500 years ago is when the Spanish had introduced the um, smallpox, and by the time they actually gave it to the Mayans, and the Mayans first introduced it into North America, and by the time the Spanish got to the coastal areas of America here, they uh, there were skeletons of people. People were yeah, already it, it had already dead. yeah, it had already run its course. The plague had gone through, and pretty much all the opposition was dead. Uh, that's how they had such an easy time of it, folks. Exactly. That's that's that is uh, that's scientific knowledge. Again, these are things that I'm basing this on. So we know that they had severe consequences in Europe and in America, here in North America and the Americas. And what 
what is leading me to this, why Sasquatch then or Bigfoot would be uh, susceptible to this is when we look at modern science today, we're finding that we have areas, myself included, I just did my own DNA, and my own DNA says that I have uh, Neanderthal DNA within me, which means at some point in history, in uh, when my family was in Germany or France, some of the my, my distant relatives, there was interbreeding with the Neanderthal. And if you are from Germany or France and have some history of your family coming from there, there's a good chance that you carry uh, Neanderthal DNA also. So folks, yeah. what that means is I'm a hybrid. I'm a living, breathing hybrid. Another yeah. hominid and, and the Homo sapien, the Neanderthal and Homo sapien got together and bred. Now what I'm also going to say, there is the Denisovan or the Denisovian that was found uh, and that they believe now that that has uh, a part of the Asian DNA or Malaysia and that's another uh, emergent hominid that they found were interbreeding with, with Homo sapien. We have a recent uh, article that I had found also in Africa and they get this from the, the sublingual, it's basically um, the, the, um, the saliva that you have that they found saliva DNA and what they have found from Africans that there is an unknown now, it's a ghost gene that there was interbreeding of early hominids in Africa and this ghost gene exists now. So the more this DNA and genetics is, is evolving and growing, that we're finding out that there were emergent hominids coming out of regions and interbreeding. Now folks, that is a rule, it's not an exception. All of these hominids were interbreeding. And so that is why I believe that when this population was affected in Europe by the plague that also the um, wood woos and the other popular, the, the, the sto stories of, that were previous there had kind of disappeared after that because one, you lost the people who were telling the stories, but two, you also, the population of the wood woos dissipated and it probably changed their behavior also. It most likely changed how they would have interacted with people. The same thing would happen here in the Native American culture here in this continent. You had devastating uh, in uh, the, when the Ponca tribe here in Nebraska, up in northeastern Nebraska, by 1803, I believe, when Lewis and Clark came in there, they previously had 800 in their tribe. They were down to 100 people in 1803 Whoa. from smallpox. Uh, so devastating to them. Uh, it destroyed that, but it also, I believe, had a heavy effect on the Sasquatch Bigfoot population. And that's why we see those two epochs in history as before and after. And that's why there's kind of those question marks and people are wondering, well, did they or didn't they exist? I believe they were affected. I believe their numbers are rebound now. And I believe entirely that we have uh, emergent hominids that were interbreeding. I believe that is scientific fact that all these early hominids were, were interbreeding and we are, I'm a living example of that. And we also know now other people have other uh, DNA, including Africans now. We know in Africa for sure now that this occurred, a ghost gene of some unknown uh, primate was interbreeding uh, with the other. And these were all hominids. Uh, these yeah. were all upright walking hominids. You couldn't breed and have offspring unless you were close enough genetically. So right. there is something going on with that and that would make you also then susceptible to these diseases. So that, that's it in a nutshell. I have it on my website. I well, as, much far, as far as that goes, let me expand on that a little bit too, just to be sure that we're being precise and scientific about this. You have to be pretty close to human genes in order to successfully inbreed with us and not just produce a mule that's sterile and can't make any offspring. So if you've got genetic um, material from Neanderthals, it means that they could successfully breed with us and they wouldn't produce mules, at least not all the time. Occasionally some would be viable and could pass it on. Um, the other thing there is that even with, uh, you know, and like 3%, I guess, uh, Neanderthal blood amongst uh, Northern Europeans is very common. Uh, Europeans yeah. are well, yeah. well mixed in with Neanderthal blood. And Neanderthal blood is also fairly common in the Asian population. There's none of it in the black African population. Uh, Neanderthal weren't in Africa. The other thing I should mention is that it seems genetically that 
the all the DNA material that we got from the Neanderthal came from the male Neanderthals. There wasn't like you know, human men having sex with female Neanderthals. Uh, so I'm, you know, this is like uh, sexual predation as far as I'm concerned. They were stealing yeah. women and raping them. Yeah, uh, that was that was certainly going on, and and that's what you're going to see. Uh, and I found that out in my own uh, genetic research. Like I said, this this uh, the Y chromosome, the male uh, paternal Y chromosome is passed on, and that's carried that carries through through the male. And that is very much unchanged. But when you have female um, maternal mitochondrial DNA, that is only half of their DNA is passed on. And it's called recombination. So every generation that female that passes it on, it's, it's through recombination. So if you have a, a brother and sis, uh, a sister and you have siblings, only half of that is passed on to them through the mother's side. And so there, you're going to have variations in your own family then if only half of those genes are passed on that way. And right. if the male Y chromosome, though, does carry through, and so that's why we can go back and uh, trace the, the male uh, genome, uh, you know, very, thousands of years more than we can the mitochondria of the female. But you're right, and I also believe that's why we have differences in the look of the, big, of the Bigfoot. And we just talked about the wood moose uh, picture there of the, the one looked eerily human with his face yeah. going over in Europe. And, and the, the thumbnail picture, picture, if you compare the picture of the one the knight fought uh, in the 1500s to the 11th century tapestry drawing from England, uh, an island I should hasten to mention, not even connected to Europe at the time, they look friggin' identical. They did, they did a yeah. drawing of the same critter 400 years apart, different parts of Europe. Yeah, they were, and they were interbreeding, they were abducting females, uh, European females, and they were having offspring, and their their offspring did have uh, more, um, the, the features were more um, uh, homo sapien uh, facial features than that. But what happens over time, when, when you get isolated populations, and when you have this epoch of contagions where we've seen where they may not have been interacting that way and kidnapping uh Native Americans anymore, which they were doing the same thing over here as they were doing in Europe, uh, you're going to see that Y chromosome raise its head and be dominant, and you're going to see more ape-like features come back. And so that's why we see a variety. Yeah, I, I wanted... agree that within the Bigfoot um, population in North America, there's a wide variety of variation. And it's just like humans. There's a wide variety of, of variation if you take a uh, you know, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, uh, straight-nosed uh, German, and compare them to an Australian Aborigine. If you were an alien looking at them, you might think they were a completely different species. But no, they're both human beings. They just had yeah. uh, natural natural effects of being in certain areas for a long time tend to limit what was being passed along genetically, and certain traits took hold. However, there's a certain limit beyond which you cannot go with that. And in North America, we have documented. Uh, Bigfoot that have a uh, snout like a baboon, that's not within the realms of that possibility. And also mm -hmm. Bigfoot have an array of teeth that would make a timber wolf jealous. Again, when you start having dramatic differences in dentition, you're not talking about the same critter. So I'm 100% convinced there are variant subspecies in North America. Yeah, I agree with you there. What What I'm talking about, the variations that we'll see will be that that dominant Y chromosome over time will continue to um, come out, and you're going to see a more ape-like features from that, the ancient uh, uh, features that will come out. And then right. if you're still – and some of these other traits in some areas you'll see. So you'll see some that will look – have. so you'll have – that's why people – I want people to, under, to take from this is that when somebody describes one, just because it isn't that, you know, it should have like a hooded nose, which means its nose is is is, is covered that goes down. It's not just holes like a complete ape that can't swim and that. Most of these are able to swim, but uh, they're very good swimmers. But the actual features, you might have one that looks mongoloid uh, for some inbreeding. You might have one that has those features, kind of mongoloid features. You might have one that has traditional kind of homo sapien features with the with the no point, more pointed nose and more uh, not so much the, the cheekbones and everything looks more 
cut and more uh, pronounced. Or you might have the one that is just and totally uh, gorilla type looking uh, facial features that that has a very wide nose, very um, uh, distinct uh, features. That's that Y chromosome over time coming out and continuing. So you're going to have a variation of that. And so I just want people to understand that, that just because somebody saw one that had mongoloid looking features and another one saw one that was that had white hair and looked human looking, uh, Homo sapien looking, doesn't mean that they're they didn't see Bigfoot. They're there yeah. they they may have just seen different variations of what that of what Bigfoot is. And that also right. tells me that that's why they were susceptible to these diseases and that explains right. why we would see these two epochs and changes in history before and after Native American folklore and all the history that is there. Uh, the, the contagion comes here, wipes them out, it wipes out Bigfoot, and they, they, they come back and they're now thriving in most of these areas. Uh, they're, they're coming back in the areas where they lived before. If there's not just a huge city, they might be on the periphery of that city, but they're right. coming back and they're there. And uh, I think this says a lot about that. I think this this is uh, fascinating to me, and um, so that's that's why I I I was glad you uh, you know asked me to come and talk about this. I think more researchers need to take an honest look at that. And uh, I actually had talked to I, I I tried to pitch this to to Dr. Meldrum back in January, uh, and for his really dominant inquiry, but he's very much in the 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 side that this is uh, outside of hybrid it's not a hybrid and that it's uh, you know its own species and and it's not a hybrid whereas I'm what I'm advocating here and now is that it is a hybrid all of these early hominids uh, interbred and uh, you know that's the norm it's not an outlier and I, I don't believe Bigfoot is an outlier I don't think it's separate I don't think it's just the Gigantopithecus. I think it's 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 a hybrid. It was a hybrid in Europe. It's a hybrid here. It was yeah. taking. It well, was Jeff, you know, himself is uh, was one of the early adopters of the Gigantopithecus theory, and he's since discarded it. He doesn't uh, believe that anymore okay. either. But well, to go back to uh, what you were talking to uh, talking about earlier, the whole crux of this thing is contagious disease. Could Bigfoot catch it from us? And let's think about this for a minute. They have to be really close to us to inbreed with us. And you know whether that was happening or not. Great apes, and this is well known, are not that close to us. Although they say, you know, gen genetically we're really similar. Yeah, there's plenty of differences there. There's plenty of differences that we can't breed with them. We cannot produce hybrid offspring with the great apes, but the great apes are susceptible to damn near every single disease we can get that's transmittable. They can get it. And if you go back to the Middle Ages, it wasn't just one plague that was going through Europe. When the Black Death went through, it was three plagues. There was the bubonic plague, which took like a week or longer to kill you. There was the pneumonic plague which was airborne and would infect your lungs and kill you in about three days. And there was a septicemic plague, which was blood carried and could kill you in a matter of hours. So some mm -hmm. of these things didn't travel very far because transportation was limited and you would tend to die before you could get to the next village and spread it. But the bubonic, the main plague, did travel all over Europe. And so somebody could like have this and like, you know, take a bite out of an apple and drop it and the wood wolf shows up and eats the rest of the apple and now he's got it and he's going to die too. And then he spreads yeah. it to the rest of the wood wolves. And the human and showed it, no sign of being sick at that point. Yeah. And they had piles of bodies in areas and certainly if they came and checked that out, uh, yeah, they were just, even if they ate the rat that spread it, you know. Well, uh, let's look at another possibility here. Suppose that some of those over there in Europe were the, some of the subtypes that we still have here like in northern uh, part of the U.S. and Canada and Alaska, that are hostile to humans and, in fact, eat humans. Okay, so they're not breeding with humans. But a dead human falls by the side of the road, hmm, free food. Well, they eat the dead human. Yeah. Then they exactly. get it, too. Yeah, yeah. It was all, there was all types of ways for that to be spread, and I have no doubt that it affected their population, at least whatever their base population was, it affected it equal to whatever the loss of, and we know at least 50 million Europeans uh, passed away, and and upwards of you know maybe 80 million or so here in uh, the North America, Native Americans. We don't know entirely the whole population, but a good percentage of eight, up to 80 percent of populations were wiped out in areas 
and that was just devastating to the culture of all of, of all those regions. And um, you know, I don't doubt at all that it would change their behavior, how they would interact too. Yeah. So they definitely. We see all the humans around. are dying off, and anybody that's having contact with them is dying. What's the first thing you're? Well, let's quit having contact with them. We're dying from yeah. something that has to do with them, because every time we get near them or anything, we get sick and die. So mm-hmm. let's stay further away from them. So outside of you know outright hostility, which may not have been the problem here, North America, like in the Pac West, some of the tribes had really good relations with the Bigfoot. There's a couple mm-hmm. tribes over there where it was not frowned upon to take one as a mate, <clears throat> and they traded with them. But all yeah. of a sudden, they're, like, not around anymore. The humans are having nothing to do with them, and all this is passing into legend. Well, right about the same time that the, the uh, diseases went through here and, you know, everybody started dying from it, all of the sort of interactions stopped happening. Yeah, I think that's very significant. And not only it happened here in North America, it happened in Europe. And you have distinct epochs of before and after in both of those areas that clearly, I think, is, is – uh, tipping points to this and then and then the modern science today that we're keep finding uh you know every year it seems like we come out we find some uh some some cousin to the to our dna that existed and now we have one in africa that they had found a ghost a ghost gene so literally all of these continents had some some uh emergent hominid interbreeding with another emergent hominid and that was happening and that that to me is that's that will be proven as a rule, not an exception. And I, so I think that this this sort of thing is going to kind of uh, lead to our better understanding of what Bigfoot is, and hopefully acceptance that it is a part of our not only our history but our presence, and uh, the current uh, time period we're living in, and, and that they've always been there. So um, it's it to me it's fascinating. It's connecting the dots where there was some gray area. I think it's clearly, you know, I'm going to go ahead and connect that dot and turn this into a a stick Bigfoot figure and <laughs> say it's <laughs> of what they are our cousin and they exist and that they died in similar numbers that, that Homo sapiens died also during those epochs. Right. And, and the point here is that so. you're, you're actually fielding a theory, a theory, okay, now we've got an idea. Let's go test it. Let's go look for more information. Let's see if we can find – Let's see if we can find ways to disprove it. That's the best way to go about it. Is there something that points against this ever happening? And is how much information is there that points toward it actually happening? And, you know, a lot of times uh, something like this will just sound like, you know, crazy on the face of it. And the more you look at it, the more it's like, God, there's really good evidence for this, you know. And everything in the old legends and lore and stuff lines up with there being this major shift where it was like business as usual, business as usual, business as usual, business as usual for centuries, and all of a sudden, everything's changed. And it's all of a sudden, and it tends to coincide with these huge uh, pandemics. It it makes a lot of sense when you look at it and historically and why you've had all these, you know, you have very rich history uh, before these plagues, and then it just kind of disappears, and then they don't, and somehow all that, they they became folklore, and you know you have all this Native American history that every tribe literally has names for them, and then you know that and then it just you know somehow that they they no longer exist that they're not a real being. Um, this it makes a lot of sense that something uh, basically those those epochs were a breaking point in in the before and after, and you have to um, you know that to me just connects the dots and it 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 makes this a whole historical perspective even more credible now uh, to use some of those references as we continue to do research. And I think right those, are, those are valuable tools for us. So, so anyway, that's, uh, I'm glad we got to share uh, some of this information because I think that it's an important part of the future of, of, of understanding this, um, emer- you know, the, the Bigfoot phenomenon. Yep. The mystery, the ABC mystery, anomalous bipedal cryptids. It's the ABC mystery. The ABCs of Bigfoot. Uh, now, before we go here, uh, I kind of teased people earlier when you mentioned the book by John Green, and I mentioned the fact that he had references to mountain giants in it. And when you were out here visiting, you actually ran into someone in a paranormal research group that had a story that might actually 
be a mountain giant. You want to share that with us? Yeah, yeah. When I was there for uh, the the comp, the Big Sky Bigfoot Conference back in 2015, I went to uh, one of the nights I went to the public library there in Missoula, and they had two speakers who were paranormal researchers, uh, ghost researchers, and uh, they gave their presentation, very interesting. I, I you know, I, I'm not into that, but I thought it was interesting. Um, and at the end of it, I went up and introduced myself and started telling him, you know, I was here uh, doing research with uh, Bigfoot research, and at the, you know, the conference, invited the guys to the conference that week. Uh, they, um, one of the guys, uh, interesting enough, just, just rather a matter of fact, said, you know, just last week I had a really weird experience. I was in my house, and I hear this sound of something bounding down the mountain. It sounded like a giant was making these huge steps, and I could hear it. And he goes, I had to go outside, and I could literally hear it. It was in the middle of the night, but I could hear it bounding across the down, – down from the mountain, coming down. And I said, really? I, I didn't know what how to put that into perspective because at that time I was doing, you know, the Bigfoot thing, and I didn't consider mountain giants. Now, after talking to you, yeah. that's obviously what it was. But, uh, yeah, he literally could hear it within his house bounding down the mountain and went outside, and he was sure the whole neighborhood had to have heard it. <laughs> <laughs> and why do we think this is not a Bigfoot report? Well, you know, Bigfoot are stealthy. They don't advertise their presence. He had no reason to make a lot of noise and scare the local homeowners if it was a Bigfoot. So this totally does not fit in the pattern of a Bigfoot. And he's describing something bipedal running down the mountain making just like massive footfalls like Godzilla's running through through, yeah. through the tree line up there on the mountain. I mean my god the guy was in his house did he even have the windows open or, or he could hear it inside think, the house he could hear it inside the house and he went outside and he said it was just unbelievable how that thing was running it, it was coming down the mountain and it was huge he said and he I don't think he even believed it was a bigfoot he he had to have thought it was something much bigger because it just was massive, and it could be heard all through that area that he was uh, that he lived in there. And I believe that was – I'm pretty sure that he was saying it was uh, in the Blue Mountain area there, right outside of – right around Missoula. Uh, yeah, and just to let folks know, that's the junction to the superhighway right there because Blue Mountain is the easternmost mountain that actually is uh, – so I, I understand part of the, uh, the Blue Mountain chain that goes out further west from here, and that's well-known Squatchy. Uh, Squatch run back and forth on that mountain chain, and it connects right up, running east-west, to the north-south Bitterroot Range, which is right on the edge of this valley. Uh, <clears throat> so, and that's well-known also as a travel route for, you know, most Bigfoot researchers. They they use that range to go back and forth to other ranges and other areas, because they can just stay in the mountains all the time, and not have to piddle around with worrying about human seam or anything. It's very convenient for them. So having these two mountain ranges, one that goes north-south and the other one goes east-west, connect right there, and that's right where it happened. Yes, exactly. So that I think that lends some credibility too. But, yeah, I mean, this was a guy who clearly uh, it, it was just circumstance that I was there and we were talking about it. It just happened the week before. So one of those stories to relay, I didn't know what to – what to make of it, uh, but I clearly, I believe, obviously, the research you're doing, that that would fall into your category, so I'll hand <laughs> <Yeah>. that off. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, and yeah, for folks that uh, have heard it, or for those that haven't heard it and want to, did an episode on Mountain Giants for Sasquatch Chronicles, and one of the uh, reports that we talked about came from right here in the Bitterroot Mountains, where there's a crew that was up there that was going to do some logging. They had gone in, made a road up into the new area that they had the lease on, uh, had left a couple of trucks up there and some equipment. We we're going to come back on Monday and start in. And when they got back, everything was destroyed. Uh, the chainsaws had blades wrapped around the trees. Um, both the trucks that they had left there were mashed. They looked like somebody had dropped a wrecking ball on them repeatedly. One was sitting right on the frame. The suspension even gave on them. You know, so like, whatever worked these things over was probably bigger than a Bigfoot anyway. But they wisely decided that uh, we have another lease pending. Let's just move to that one and go there. And they never came back to the area. So, <clears throat> you know, and this is, uh, this is a story from a guy who had spent his entire lifetime as a logger in the Bitterroot Mountains and was retired at the time that one of my field researchers ran into him and got this story out of him. Uh, and he said, well, yeah, you know, we'd, we'd see Bigfoot sign and 
you know, some of the guys on the crew would see one occasionally or something. We knew they were out there. We just didn't talk about it. That's a longer thing. But this other thing, here's the one that scared me. And then he went, told my friend this story. So, of course, he he got right to me and went, hey, hey, you think this is a mountain giant story? And I'm like, are you friggin' kidding me? It better be a mountain giant story because I hope Godzilla isn't wandering around up there. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, same area, same mountain range. So it would not surprise me whatsoever if it was uh, a mountain giant going from point A to point B, and uh, again, you know, um, they're said to be nocturnal, stay underground during the day, come up at night, do their hunting and moving around then. Um, and one of the other things connected to them is a really high-pitched, extremely loud whistling sound, which occasionally mm-hmm. they will do when they're wandering around in, in the dark, apparently, uh, which is <clears throat> a warning to all of those that hear a really loud, high-pitched whistling sound in the dark, to go the opposite direction away from it. But, uh, man, thanks for coming on and sharing all this stuff with us. I was really hoping that I could get somebody on to talk about some of the possibilities of contagion spreading around and having a lot to do with the lessening of the the population of these things. And, you know, just now finally rebounding here in North America, we're getting more reports of it. And uh, so we think the population is actually on on the rise here again. But, uh, you know, fascinating, fascinating stuff. And uh, thanks for coming back and sharing it with us. I want to say thanks to Sibylia Irwin for letting us use some of your illustrations in the show. Thanks very much, dear. really appreciate it. Um, and was there anything else you wanted to, to mention? Uh, just want to mention that we have the Bigfoot Conference coming up in Nebraska. Kind of give a, a tout to the local um, researchers doing things here, and that's coming up in February. Uh, Harriet McFeely is doing that, and Robin Roberts is coming in from Colorado. She helps out with that. So uh, just giving uh, giving them a little uh, – want people to know that the, the Bigfoot is alive and well here in Nebraska, and the research that I'm doing is uh, – and contributions are being shared everywhere. So I uh, just appreciate you having me on again. Uh, there, I've got other st- uh, more information, too, if you ever uh, want to bring me back. <laughs> More to share. So, uh, you hear that, guys? Just, if you want them to come back, pastor me. Because that's, <laughs> that's how I decide to have guests back. When I get pastored, yeah. I decide to have them back. So it's up to you guys. Cool, cool. But, yeah, good times, dude. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks again for coming on the show, Rich. And thanks to everybody for listening in. Hope you're all having a great time and that uh, your state isn't burning down or being hit by hurricanes and that uh, you're having a peaceful and wonderful fall. In the meantime, take care of everybody else around you. Be kind to other people. And remember, whatever you do, do not hug the Wookiee. See you later, folks.